Excellent. So I um, personally have no conflicts of interest related to this presentation. However, my research institute did receive funding from the WHO to help uh, facilitate creation of the practical guide. So I'm going to discuss some different rapid review methods as well as how to engage knowledge users in rapid reviews. And this is both these uh, two topics are part of the guide. So I'm presenting two different chapters that are part of the guide that um, ATN had provided the link for. So the evidence base supporting streamlined methods is limited and evolving. Um, and as ATN notes, uh, to try to further the research agenda, we actually need more evidence to figure out which are the most robust approaches. So we've recently conducted a systematic review looking at all of the limitations um, when for screening during the systematic review for data abstraction and quality appraisal. Um, so this systematic review was registered with Prospero. It's a methodological review and we're specifically looking at the evidence base for methodological shortcuts. And preliminary findings of our review are recorded in the guide. Um, I believe it's in chapter three. So this will be submitted for publication in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology in the next month or so. But basically, when we look at the evidence base, we see that we don't find much evidence on the implications of um, searching more than one database for published studies or using date and language search limitations. So there is some empirical evidence um, if you to suggest that you need to search more than uh, one database, for example. However, and we do have some empirical evidence on limiting to published studies, um, as well as some language search limitations, but we haven't found, you know, on average, uh, what the, the estimate of bias would be for this particular shortcut. Um, when it comes to study selection, so when we talk about should we have one reviewer and perhaps uh, with or without verification, we see that if we have one person screening the titles and abstracts, we miss an average of about 8 to 20 percent of eligible studies. However, it does reduce the time uh, quite a bit when, versus having two people screening the literature search results. And when we think about data abstraction, so if we have one person abstracting with or without verification, we do see that there are more errors. Um, however, time is being saved. And when we've looked at meta-analysis, the empirical evidence suggests that these changes actually didn't significantly affect the overall uh, meta-analysis results. Um, for quality assessment, if we have one reviewer assess with or without verification, again, we don't have as much evidence on this. Um, so just showing that um, there, there are some gaps that potentially can be filled. In terms of some steps that we would recommend, um, so when you're doing a rapid review and you want to do things a bit faster, but you want to kind of balance this whole risk of bias versus timeliness of results, we recommend including content experts as well as experienced reviewers. So if you have people who know the area really, really well, and if you have people who know how to do reviews and, and have been doing them for a few years, it actually will help enhance the rigor and it will also help make the review process a lot faster. So you can imagine if you're a content expert and you know the field quite well, you would be able to screen faster and perhaps screen with a little bit more higher validity or reliability if you know the field quite well uh, versus someone who's, who's a junior in the, in the area or new to the field and has to look up a lot of information. So for the rapid review teams, so if we have content experts in health policy and systems research, as well as experienced reviewers who are, are experienced in study selection, data abstraction, and quality appraisal, we're hoping that this will actually make a faster and potentially more rigorous process. Um, another great thing about including content experts on your team is that they can answer questions along the way. 
and it's great to find people who are quite responsive. So we do a lot of clinical reviews, so we, and we work with a lot of clinicians, and we have an ongoing list of clinicians that we know are quite responsive. So those are the people that we want to collaborate with on our, our systematic reviews or our, our rapid reviews because they answer us quickly and we're able to kind of keep going with the process quite fast. As well, if we have well-defined eligibility criteria, if we use explanation and elaboration forms, as well as pilot testing, the uh, screening forms and data abstraction forms. Um, so just, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with pilot testing, but uh, basically it's a calibration exercise. So what we would do is we would devise our inclusion and exclusion criteria or study eligibility criteria. And then we would choose a random sample of 25 citations for the level one screening of titles and abstracts. And what we would do is we would have the entire team actually test out the eligibility form on these 25 uh, random, a random sample of 25 citations. So let's say we have 10 people on the team. All 10 people would go ahead and they would uh, screen the 25 citations and then we would calculate a percent agreement. And we usually don't proceed unless we have a greater than 75% agreement. Another thing that we do is we tend to see how people did on the, the screening uh, in the pilot test, and we tend to match up the weaker screeners with the stronger screeners. So people who scored perfectly and had perfect agreement with the correct answers, we would assign them uh, to screen and duplicate with the person who perhaps had a lower agreement on average than the others, for example. So that um, makes sure that we're able to um, screen things more efficiently in a sense. Um, there may be more conflicts the way that we set it up, but hopefully nothing is missed to increase the reliability. So if we use well-defined eligibility criteria, explanation and elaboration forms, we pilot test, we do review training, and um, this should hopefully support reviewers in study selection, data abstraction, as well as quality assessment. So this is a nice visual of some of the things that we can do to improve quality and efficiency. So again, let's make sure that we use uh, very clear eligibility criteria. What we do with my, with my team is that we would have a senior research coordinator would help establish the eligibility criteria. And then this would be reviewed by the support research coordinator on the team. And then this would be reviewed by myself, um, who would be the review methodologist. And it would also be reviewed by the content expert. And this way we have all of the information ready to go for our calibration test. And then we usually do some tweaking during the calibration test to make sure that the eligibility criteria are very clear. Um, in our elaboration and, and um, uh, elaboration forms, we have a lot of examples. We have a bunch of definitions, so we clearly outline. We want you to focus on randomized trials, for example. The definition of a randomized trial is this, as an example. Uh, we want you to include children, and to be conservative, let's include any study where the children are age 21 years or less, for example. So we, we provide definitions on every single item uh, to make it very clear to people when they're screening. So another thing that we can do is to consult authors of the studies. And again, sometimes it does take time for authors to get back to you. In general, we've been tracking this for a couple of years. We usually get about 65% response from authors, but it doesn't necessarily mean we get the answer that we want. So many times, even though 65% of them will respond, they may not necessarily give us the data. Um, they may say that the study was too old, or they may say that um, they don't have the time to give us the necessary details that we're looking for. So if you do have a bit of time and you're not sure about a particular study, 
one thing to consider is potentially contacting authors. And if you do get success, if you are successful and they respond quickly, then then you're quite fortunate and you can potentially use this to, to inform your rapid review. One thing to note is that we usually give a time cutoff. So we usually say that we will contact authors this month and we'll allow them four weeks to respond. If it's a rapid review and you only have five weeks to do the rapid review, then this might be something that you would potentially not be able to do. However, if you have a longer timeline for a rapid review, like 12 weeks, then potentially you can say, let's contact these 10 authors and give them one or two weeks to respond. And if we don't hear back from them, we will proceed. So this is just a nice visual again, just to highlight how um, we can contact them. So some of the information that we ask about is related to whether the study actually is eligible. So thinking about the different components of your eligibility criteria and asking for clarification on that. Sometimes we want the data to be reported in a different way. So uh, we know that it's a relevant study, but it's not reported in a way that we can abstract the data. So it would be asking for data clarifications. I have to say that those would probably be the two most common reasons that uh, we contact authors. However, there are other reasons that you may contact them. For example, I know some review centers contact authors to ask about risk of bias. So asking whether allocation concealment, uh, as an example, was, was performed. 